Hi, and welcome to the Disruptive Innovation Festival, the world's largest online festival of ideas, where we ask the question, what if we could redesign everything? My name is Henriette Goddard, and um, this session is Cities of Making, where we're going to be exploring the topic of urban manufacturing, what it is, how you do it, and why it's a good thing. So please do join in the discussion by posting your, your comments and your questions in the comments box, which should be just to the right of your screens. Um, or you can uh, post questions via Twitter using hashtag thinkdiff. So leading the group discussion is Teresa Dominic, who is director of the MSc Sustainable Resources course at uh, University College London or UCL and co-director of the UCL Circular Economy Lab. Teresa is joined by Adrian Vickery Hill, who is a researcher, designer, and planner, and Michael Peckstein, who is currently on the Sustainable Resources Economics Policy and Transitions Master Program. Um, and he's also the student representative for the 30 or so other students who are also in the room. Um, so welcome everybody, and over to you, Teresa. So guys, guys are, um, at UCL, I think you need to unmute yourselves. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> thank you so much, Henrietta, and thank you everyone that is joining the session. Uh, we propose this session, Cities of Making, because we firmly believe that manufacturing is a key piece within the transition to circular cities, to um, increasing circularity in cities. And uh, we are going to start by just saying a few things about ourselves around the table, just to introduce ourselves, just to say why are we interested in manufacturing and why we think manufacturing has a key role to play in circular economy. So let's try, I'll start with myself. I'm uh, Teresa Domenech, as you mentioned. I'm the course director for Sustainable Resources, a master course that is um, dealing with these issues of transition to circular economy, a transition to more efficient way of using resources, but also to more regenerative systems. Uh, my main research interest lies in the area of, of circular economy. I'm especially interested in cities and trying to see how cities consume resources and how can we change the way uh, cities consume resources and change from um, quite impactful cities it's from an environmental point of, of view to regenerative cities that um, offer opportunities for everyone and also have a positive contribution to the environment. Cities of Making is a project that uh, came uh, from a Hi guys, um, I think we're having a bit of a technical issue, so um, we will be back as soon as possible. Um, so if you hang on in there um, and, and we'll be back.
We're back. So we Hi, guys. Hi, sorry. It wouldn't be the same if there wasn't a technical issue. So um, hopefully we've got that out of the way. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> well, speaking of technical issues, that this is a, this was one of the, the questions that I had, which was we were talking. I'm not sure where, where w what point you, you uh, we lost you in the, in the uh, introduction, but anyway, my, I have a background in planning, and um, and I was very interested in, in the question of what cities should be making, and so there are many different uh, um, issues which you could unpack that question. Uh, in terms of jobs, in terms of resources, in terms of space, in terms of innovation, in terms of technology. And of course, over the last decade, we've, we've seen a, a wave of new forms of technology and uh, new interest in resources. And so <clears throat> manufacturing um, production, in theory, could be happening in very different parts of cities. Um, and so there was a big question about, you yeah, know, where, where, um, firstly, what, what kinds of uh, manufacturing and resources were going to be the future of, uh, of manufacturing? Second question was, where was it going to happen? Is it going to happen in traditional zones of manufacturing, or was it going to happen <coughs> under buildings and formerly former car parks, perhaps, or on roofs, um, or in apartment buildings if manufacturing was going to be downsized? Um, and then there's a question of how, you know, the question of do we hold how do we hold on to existing manufacturing how do we support new forms of manufacturing how do we get rid of manufacturing that we don't want how do we keep manufacturing that we do want so eventually this this is what turned into the basis of this project cities and making and i'll pass some to mine right uh my name is michael Fleshlein. um as you said i'm a student here at ucl in the sustainable resources program um so we're looking mostly at resource use and how those things can be revamped more sustainably and in a more green way in the global economy. Um, so doing a lot of work along those lines and my other relevance to this panel is that uh, in a previous life, before I came here to study in London, um, I worked uh, in New York and on the side, I started a small furniture business, uh, building furniture focused on reclaimed wood and lumber and other building materials. Um, so I started that uh, literally out of my apartment, but then eventually worked into uh, some co-working spaces and some professional workshops. So I got a lot of experience there into what it's like, you know, starting a small business in a major city, um, working with a lot of other suppliers and manufacturing businesses and seeing what some of their benefits and challenges were. So hopefully I can lend some of that experience today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian and Michael. Um, I would like to start the, the debate here, the discussion, with a question around uh, the what. What are uh, what is uh, urban manufacturing? Is manufacturing in the cities? But actually, the question is a bit more complex than that. It's about what is manufacturing. And actually, when we are doing our research, we sometimes find it difficult to define a clear boundary of what is uh, manufacturing. So I was wanted to I wanted to hear a bit the um, the definition from Adrian and, and Michael about what is urban manufacturing and how can define it? What are the key characteristic elements that uh, differentiate manufacturing in the cities from other sorts of manufacturing? It's a question that we were really, spent as you know, hours. <laughs> spent hours trying to get to the bottom of. But mm -hmm. because manufacturing in principle, as, as, we, um, as we concluded, is based on, it's based on transformation of materials, um, it's based on an element, possibly an element of manual labour, some kind of labour aspect. It's about. It's based on 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 certainly um, skills and technology. Um, what makes it urban from say non-urban manufacturing? That's a fairly uh, difficult question to answer. But we could simply say that um, what are the what's the form of manufacturing that depends on on, on say a population and uh, a customer base which is in a, in a, in a relatively well-defined um, urban, urban area. Um, but of course you can start to think about other kinds of associated um, activities such as logistics, such as uh, design, such as uh, um, yeah, research, um, such as recycling, um, such as construction. 
And that's where we found that the, the definition blurs and it's difficult for us to say what is and what isn't. And we've, we've, we've literally accepted that, that we can't define what is and what's not manufacturing, but we accept that there is a certain level of activity which um, in some, um, some cases the city depends on, in other cases creates a kind of local economy which is extremely important for that place. Yeah, um, yeah, I can totally agree with what you're saying. Um, you know, manufacturing, obviously, in the most traditional sense, is building things using manual labor. Um, but to your point, it does take a lot of support services to run a small manufacturing business, especially in a major city. Um, building, running a furniture business without a truck, highly do not recommend. Uh, but yeah, so that's one of the big, big advantages, I think, of being in an urban environment. Um, is support services like logistics, shipping, having a photographer come in on a few hours notice to do some shoots for a website, having someone build said website, all of those things are much more available to you and much more accessible in an urban environment. So I think it's more conducive for a small scale business. Yeah, I think one of the other key findings that we have um, kind of derived from our research is that urban manufacturing has also this characteristic of being very hybrid. So it's um, many times manufacturing activity is very, very extremely linked to design, it's linked to retailing, it's linked to training. So there's always uh, multiple phases associated with the manufacturing itself. It doesn't normally happen in its own, it happens associated with other very uh, related activities. So it's a very hybrid type of manufacturing and, and we quite like that, I mean, from the kind of more sustainable point of view, because it really opens the space for eco-innovation, introducing um, sustainable in features in the in the design of the products and also changing the way we interact with the products. So I think from the point of view of uh, circular economy and sustainability, having this um, characteristic of hybrid manufacturing actually could make a very disruptive change in the way we manufacture things and also in the in the kind of products we we actually produce or, or make in, in the cities. So I think that's quite, quite an important findings from, from our research as well. And I think uh, I think one of the other uh, issues that uh, Michael and Adrian both were mentioning, both of them, is the scale. Uh, having a scale and having agglomeration economies, having um, multiple manufacturers, makers, and also supporting services, but also um, skilled staff, for example, is really key for uh, manufacturing in cities because gas cities. Um, and manufacturing within cities some sort of aids and you will see that most of the products manufactured in cities made in cities have very high component of knowledge embedded in the product so it's kind of not always really high advanced technology but it's also how knowledge has been embedded in the way you design the products and you market your products so i think that's quite a characteristic so of urban manufacturing I think the other thing that we were discussing when we planned these sessions about who, who is the urban manufacturer uh, and what is the role of the urban manufacturer. And here maybe the experience of Michael as urban manufacturer can, can bring some, some light to, to this issue and we can maybe, Adrian and me, we can bring also um, findings from our research. Sure. Um, in my experience at least, which obviously is a, a small sample set, but um, I can tell you I started my small scale manufacturing gig um, sort of just as a hobby, as I, I'm guessing a lot of people do. And I think, you know, nowadays in an environment where a lot of manufacturing is done on a mass scale and done offshore, um, it's something that people have lost touch with over time, but in a little bit of a backlash to that, you know, I think people are regaining interest in that. People really want to understand where the things come from and how they're made. And you see a lot of people getting into making um, as a result. So a lot of the people that I worked with over the years were um, either pretty blue collar in background or not, or had you know some sort of white collar job they were doing and um, got disgruntled or got sick of it or really fell in love with doing something else and um, started uh, doing manufacturing. So it's definitely a mix <clears throat> of people, um, but that's really valuable you know, because you get a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different expertise and insight from that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's exactly the kind of people we are meeting in our field work. We are meeting a lot of people that had previously office jobs and then suddenly became makers because they want to experience uh, and create something with their hands in a way and also take control of the whole uh, process from the design of the product to the final manufacturing. And I think one of, one of the um, things that we have discussed in our research is how uh, much making things and designing uh, is connected with the with the innovation and creation process. So it's very difficult to design things that you are not making because during the process of making them, you actually understand better the product and understand better how it can be used. Uh, and that creates um, a different understanding, more holistic understanding of the, of the, of the product itself or, or the product system. And I think that's also quite important when we talk about circular economy and we talk about a new way to live in cities and a new way of, um, to organize cities. I think having some control over the products that are used within cities will make a real difference in uh, transition. So, some sort of more circular use of resources, but not only resources in terms of materials, but also, for example, people and uh, skills, which is something that is quite related to urban manufacturing as well. Um, I know that we are a bit pressed sometimes. I think I will move to the next um, kind of question that it was, why in cities? Why is this all this movement happening in cities? And uh, what is the role that manufacturing has to play uh, in the transition towards more circular cities? Well, cities, uh, as we know, are a, a large um, magnet for materials. And this is where you traditionally would think of materials come to cities to die, which is not what we want to be doing with these materials. We we've obviously, the reason why we're speaking today is because we see that materials have a much more significant uh, um, value in the in an, in an ecosystem, and and so um, so the, this the uh, uh, having access to these materials and then uh, and and access to knowledge and access to to finance uh, means that you can very quickly um, build new ideas on old ideas. So that's a that's a, a very critical aspect of, of, um, of manufacturing. Then you have, of course, um, the, 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 fact, the, the, um, the fact that there's competition in cities, which is extremely important to drive innovation. And, and you can be somewhere lost in, in the countryside uh, and, and be doing something okay and, and survive um, comfortably, but there's no competition, so why change? Whereas in cities, there's competition, there's pressure, um, there's there's, um, there's there's often someone coming up with a similar um, version of, of an established idea, and that's what that's what creates that, that blooming of of, uh, of um, opportunity. Yeah, I agree completely uh, about competition. It's cities, you know, the industries are a lot more dynamic, and competition is a lot more concentrated, and I think that really does drive innovation uh, among businesses. Um, in addition to that, you know. Small scale manufacturing, very entrepreneurial in nature, and especially if you're trying to couple that with sustainability and circularity efforts, those are kind of <clears throat> new budding concepts that um, are going to involve not only a lot of young people, but a lot of very entrepreneurially minded people. And young entrepreneurs is something that is easy to find in major cities. So I think that's a natural breeding ground. Certainly, cities are a place where people are prepared to take risks. And I think that's. That's um, it's something that we, I think we've, we've, of course, we expect from the finance sector and we expect from, from businesses generally, but in terms of, of actual, the, the production phase, it's something that we, I think, cities have forgotten about um, in the 21st century and, and are willing to revisit and with this rise of the maker movement. It's certainly very encouraging to see that people are prepared to get their hands dirty and try new things. Yeah, definitely. I think um, there's one um, non-binding objective of the European uh, Commission, which is uh, maintaining a 20% share of industry and manufacturing activity in Europe. And I think that was motivated because um, there was a number of uh, alarming 
issues, for example, the, the loss of certain skills and also the, the connection between manufacturing and improvement in, in competitiveness and productivity. And therefore, there was a, a push toward um, maintaining some sort of manufacturing, but I think there was also uh, quite a lack of knowledge about what kind of manufacturing would be good to promote and how to promote that manufacturing. And what we have seen in the cities has been a bit of a reflection of that. There's some sort of sense that you have to promote to protect some manufacturing activity within the city because it creates jobs but also it creates innovation and if we think about most of the innovations coming up in 21st century they have come out from manufacturing and then they have um kind of spill over other sectors of activity like services but actually most of the innovation processes happen tend to happen in manufacturing and having an, a nurture that manufacturing has been some sort of objective has been there in policies, but actually how to do it in practice has been um, something that uh, policymakers have been unable to really do very well. And here in London, we have we are um, broadcasting here from London, and I think we have real clear examples of way uh, in which uh, urban regeneration has damaged uh, manufacturing activity in the city. And I think what we have seen in many cities is that urban regeneration means uh, taking all industrial areas and transforming it to flashy new apartments. And actually that's uh, kind of missing the point of what is a, um, a diverse and unsustainable city because a diverse and sustainable city also needs to have manufacturing because as Adrian was saying, uh, cities have become a consumption hub. 70% um, of the resources, global resources, are consumed within cities. So what uh, happens in cities actually is going to completely transform the way we use resources. Um, but actually, because uh, most of the manufacturing activities are not located in the cities, most of those resources in cities will end up in landfills or incineration. Uh, so there's not a lot of capacity within cities to actually regenerate those resources once they reach the end, uh, their use life into new resources. And I think that uh, with this project, we also wanted to unleash that area of innovation is transforming existing waste streams within cities into something that could be raw materials for manufacturing new products for the city, trying to close the loop of cities and to make cities more resilient, but also um, less um, reducing the wastage of resources within cities. And um, yeah, I think we have done a few, of, um, a number of, of uh, well, we have investigated a number of ways in which that could be unleashed or promoted through a combination of policies, but also a combination of actions uh, at the manufacturing level. So trying, for example, uh, to uh, build together networks within manufacturing activities so that there could be a more um, integrated way in which resources are used and also manage that knowledge of where resources are used and where waste are produced is something that is missing at the moment and that will uh, help to generate those opportunities to use waste as a resource and to close the, um, the loop of cities. Um, do you have any anything yeah, I mean, else to say, Michael? I can talk about uh, sustainability and trying to reduce waste for a second. There was a, <clears throat> a really excellent business um, in Brooklyn and Queens. They have two different uh, headquarters, but um, it was called Build It Green New York, and they're basically a company that would buy what's called stripping rights. So if a building uh, is being torn down and demolished. Um, They'd say, I'll give you X thousand dollars to go in and basically take whatever I want before you knock the thing down. So they take out, you know, railings, beautiful old flooring, uh, beams, mantelpieces, like things that are decorative and nice, but also just really raw, large scale building materials. Um, and then they had warehouses where they would sell the stuff secondhand. So um, it was great for me because you can basically put the word reclaimed in front of anything and triple the price of it in the furniture <laughs> business. Um, so I would go in and buy old scaffolding planks and floorboards for pennies on the dollar um, and actually get a better product and you know people do that large scale with piping, plumbing equipment, all kinds of stuff in these warehouses um, as a perfect example of you know kind of taking these waste streams where cities resources go to die and turning them back around. Um, so you know more efforts like that would be fantastic but unfortunately six months ago this business uh, 
went down because the rents increased too much. They had warehouses in sort of waterfront areas that, like you said, were being redeveloped into fancy new condominiums. Um, so I think, you know, policy to sort of promote and protect businesses like that is important as well. Yeah, I think that's uh, quite interesting because we are finding that uh, similar issues here in Europe where space is going, is a major issue for maintaining manufacturing activities in the city and manufacturing activities are being pushed to the fringe of the city, but even those areas now are being redeveloped and turn into residential activities without uh, acknowledging the role of manufacturing within circular economy. I think when we talk about circular economy in cities, we normally talk about the uh, mobility, we talk about buildings, we talk about consumption, but we normally very rarely have seen people talking about manufacturing in cities as a key role uh, within the whole puzzle of, of circularity in cities. And actually, if we don't have the manufacturing side, if we don't have the production side, there's nothing much we can do with the waste resources that are being produced in, within cities. And I think acknowledging that role and, and also having um, tools and uh, having support mechanisms for manufacturers to be able to manage those resources more efficiently and be able to identify where are possible um, waste streams that can be used as a raw material. I think that's really important. I do, I do say that um, it's not, mm, it's, it's, it's actually very challenging to, uh, to, to try and break through into one of these waste streams because um, cities have become so efficient in, in managing resources. And so, so waste is often um, managed by, by certain businesses that already have a certain way of dealing with things. And cutting into that is a, is a real challenge, which I think if we're talking about disruption is, is a really interesting area of opportunity because, for instance, I live in Brussels. We have organic waste, which constitutes something like 50% of uh, of your of your rubbish bin you throw out approximately. It's uh, it depends on where you place to place, but it's a it's a significant amount of waste. And um, the waste, if you want, organic waste can be treated. It's put in in, in brown uh, bags, and it's sent 130 kilometers away to be uh, to be treated in a in a biogas plant. 130 kilometers away. It doesn't make any sense at all. But why is that? It's because we have this, this, um, these contracts which can't be broken, mm. which means that we, a small player who, who wants to, to break into this and do something interesting uh, with, the, with certain resources is really challenged by, by, by this um, management process which, which is blocking uh, innovation. So, so it's a, it's a really interesting area of opportunity. Um, and I'll give you an, a, a, an example which we could, um, the example of reusing uh, construction uh, materials is a very accessible one because that, that's, that's one that can, it's much easier to access the, those kind of resources. But for instance, um, we could argue whether this is manufacturing or not, but we have uh, an example in Brussels of, of, uh, of mushrooms being produced in, in the basement of a of an old building, and this is something that's, that's popping up all, um, all throughout Europe. Um, and so basically, um, there's a bunch of, uh, of guys that have set up this business where they would um, trap the, the coffee grinds from a, uh, or an organic restaurant, uh, restaurant chain, and then they would take it to the basement of this, um, this building and then grow their, their, their mushrooms there. But of course, that's a real challenge because the reflex for everyone in, in, in the process uh, is to just throw the, 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 the coffee grinds into the bin. So you have to go through this training process to, to tell these people, don't throw your, your, your coffee grinds, the baristas to, to, to put their waste into a separate bin, which people can come on and collect, which then this business had to then personally come and collect as well. So there's an incredible cost which, which comes associated with this. The mushrooms, which, which I buy myself, um, a double the price of what you, you would pay for, uh, for for commercial mushrooms growing in a big big, big farm, but I feel like it's worth it. So I so I buy it. But you, you see, there's a whole there's a whole problem with the with the way that the resources are circulated, which don't allow these these kind of businesses to pop up. I think um, I think we're going to start opening up um, the session for. I know that there's some questions from the student with students, which I think um, Michael has. 
has rounded up. So, and then um, we've also got some really great questions coming in uh, from our online audience. So, um, Michael, do you want to do you want to start sharing some of the questions um, from your students? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, the first question was around policy and government. So, you know, obviously, city governments are pretty friendly to the businesses that they want to build and promote in their cities. Um, so what do you think is the most important things that local governments can do to support small scale manufacturing and stoke this fire a little bit? Yeah, I think from um, from what we have seen, I think it's mostly protecting industrial spaces. I think as you were mentioning, all the manufacturers have really great entrepreneurs and they really have clear ideas of where and how to manage their businesses. So they are not a lack of ideas on how to manage their business, find new markets, uh, send things to um, open up to the international markets even. Uh, but I think they are struggling with spatial issues because they are being um, uh, either um, pushed from a specific areas and that also creates a, a, most of the companies we have interviewed in London, they have moved like three or four times in the last five years because um, well, there has been regeneration projects or they have been the price of the rent has increased um, very, very, very substantially because they have built offices next door. And issues like that means that they all this network of companies and those connections, those interactions between businesses are broken because of their relocation. So I think um, protecting spaces for industry is a key issue that policymakers should and, and could do. And I think uh, partly they don't do it because they lack understanding of what is the role of manufacturing and what manufacturing needs. So I think giving them some guidance on actually how to protect those spaces it will be really important. There's the, um, uh, if we talk about London, this, um, the, the, the Greater London Authority is, um, uh, is going through a new plan and the, the, the idea is to think about space in three dimensions rather than in, in um, square meters. And the idea is that we need to make land work much harder because we have tension with housing. And so therefore there's a, there's a an idea of, of co-location, which means that we can have a productive activity on the ground floor and then other kinds of activities such as housing, or offices or what should we, whatever above which is in theory very interesting. However, what it creates is a lot of tension between these different kinds of activities. So that's, um, as, as Teresa was saying, um, having, uh, keeping a certain range of spaces um, uh, available for making a lot of noise and dust and for big trucks and things like that is super important. The second thing I would, um, I would add, and that's something which we don't, uh, we probably take for granted is is how businesses and um, entrepreneurs, researchers start to connect their ideas, and often that's <coughs> happening in kind of a um, in parallel, you might say. <laughs> businesses really struggle to connect to universities. Um, entrepreneurs struggle to find local businesses to, to develop their, pro their, their products, and so. That's, a, I think, a really critical um, um, a role that, that someone needs to, to play within this ecosystem to create an ecosystem. So, yeah, I, I think that the, the idea of a curator or a facilitator or some, some organisation that sits in the middle is extremely important. How that's funded and, what, and how that operates in, in practice is, is, a, is a real question. But I think um, that's something which cities, if they accept that manufacturing and making is really important, should find a way that that can be supported. Great. Um, next question we had was, uh, <clears throat> are SMEs the main focus in this trend, or do you think there is ever going to be a role in the future for big corporations and multinationals to bring manufacturing back to the cities? I think you, need a, you really need an ecosystem, both big and small. Because if you don't, then uh, the, big, the big actors help to create stability. Um, they have a large workforce, which means that you can try to keep things in much longer terms. Um, big generally also means slow. 
uh, and that's why you need small. And small can also be customized easily. Um, much more um, uh, concerned about how the market goes up and down. And so, therefore, if you don't have if you don't have a range of different actors, then you can uh, you can risk um, losing the capacity for, for manufacturing to, to add value to it. Yeah. I completely agree. I think uh, also big companies have a role to play in urban manufacturing because they also bring um, connections to the small and medium companies and make it since small and medium companies will uh, uh, do some sort of jobs for the big manufacturers. So there's a lot of outsourcing of acti specific activities to small and medium companies. And as Adrian was saying, um, that creates a sort of ecosystem where you have large um kind of more predator type of companies and then you have a smaller disruptive uh companies that can bring innovation can bring flexibility can bring uh um different uh areas of business to the to the large corporations i think both of them might play a role and, and the key thing is how you um kind of maintain that ecosystem in, in, in terms that is balanced and um you have still Kind of distributed um, uh, technologies and distributed uh, power and and access to to, for example, design. I have um, a great question um, from Jojo M online, um, who asks, "How do we make sure that urban manufacturing doesn't simply become another way of making a more um, efficient linear system?" It's manufacturing is not circular economy. They, they're similar, and I think that that's that's one of the paradigms that we have to accept is that um, it's uh, <coughs> that, 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 that companies in some cases um, there won't there won't be a, a way to 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 recirculate -cir um, resources within one single urban area. For instance, metals. Uh, in Belgium, where I live, um, we have a couple of metal recycling plants, and that is for the entire country. So to expect that that, um, that one city could do that is is um, is almost ridiculous. Um, however, of course, you, you're going to have your manufacturers. So that's that's a, that's the that's the paradigm. Yeah, I think in I think potentially cities could actually bring disruption into manufacturing. And I think um, becoming more circular, and we have seen it in, in urban manufacturing here in London. It's a lot of businesses that are actually um, trying to exploit or trying to improve the circularity side of their businesses because they see a real benefit to it, and also because they are um, they are that's part of the innovation in the product and innovation in the processes. And I think. Um, urban manufacturing is very open to innovation and i think that's why they are in cities because they want to uh, kind of breathe that innovation they, they want to have access to skill staff they want to also collaborate with other potential innovators and bring ideas together uh, so i think that innovation element to urban manufacturing could be quite critical to a transition from linear to circular systems and in fact most of the circular companies that we have seen um, in examples of circular companies around the world, they have tend to, to emerge in cities. And I think that cities have the scale to um, also make the, the issue of consumption of resources a more evident issue. So I think urban manufacturers are more open to, to have a new way to look at resources and how those resources are managed. And also because the scale is there, I think the city has to implement solutions to become more circular. And how do how do people find out more? Um, I believe Teresa, you, you've um, your your study will be the study that you're doing will be made available for the for the public. Um, but yeah, how are the various ways that people can find out more or if they want to get involved? How do they do that? Yeah, I think definitely we would like people to give us feedback, and all our uh, documents and all our outcomes are in the in the website for the project, which is citiesofmaking.com. And definitely, there uh, also to contact us directly or to contact um, Adrian, which is the coordinator of the project. 
And I think it will really welcome uh, feedback from other people and even from other parts of the world because it's kind of this project is quite Europe centric in a way. But we also want to understand how this thing, these things could work in, in their countries and the global south. That's that's really great. Thank you, guys. And um, and yeah, if people have questions um, still, please just keep posting them because we will find a way of, of getting back to you. Um, and it's been super interesting hearing that how um, cities can uh, drive uh, competition and innovation and how we can perhaps become part of the design process and the making of the new products and 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 things like what policy can do to help with spatial issues. So it's been really, really interesting. Thank you very much, guys. Um, and if each of you could really quickly, in one word, just sum up the future of sustainable urban manufacturing in one word, one word, what would that be? I got this, networking. <laughs> risk taking, innovation. That risk taking, that better be hyphenated. <laughs> um, so I'd like to say a really big thank you to uh, Teresa, Adrian, Michael, and all of students that are in the room. Um, and as I said, if any of you in the diff audience have more questions, then please do keep posting them and keep using Twitter, using hashtag thinkdiff. Um, and just a few words about what's coming up. Um, today is the penultimate day of the diff. Uh, but don't be too sad. You can still watch uh, previous sessions on catch up. And there are still over 20 sessions coming up. So um, after this discussion, for example, you can hear how we redefine the ways that we live, work and shop. And that session is called Innovation in Placemaking for Positive Change. And then later today on the sofas in the studio, you can hear how we might make cities cleaner, safer and more productive. Um, and that session is called Cities Regenerated. And then of course, tomorrow, um, the DIFF grand finale is coming up uh, where the themes and the ideas that have come out, come up through this 2018 Disruptive Innovation Festival are discussed. Um, so don't go away, keep your questions coming in. And thanks again for, for a great discussion, guys, um, and see you next time at the DIFF. Thank you.